This video is brought to you by Squarespace. From website and online store to marketing tools and analytics, Squarespace is the all-in-one platform to build a beautiful presence online or run your business. Now, more on this later, but for now, ciao fan! <laughs> Hey guys, salut, this is Alex. Welcome back to the stir fry series where I'm trying to perfect chow fan. That's Mandarin for fried rice. Not at a home cooking level, no, at a restaurant level. In the previous episode, in episode number two, I had the unbelievable opportunity to meet a Chinese cooking grandmaster, basically a stir fry artist. I learned so much during that episode that is absolutely insane. I guess the biggest takeaway, <laughs> I guess the biggest takeaway is that I now have a very clear and quite tangible representation of what great fried rice is supposed to not only look like, but also taste like. I mean, when it's done amazingly right. The fried rice he made was light fragrant, warm, but still fresh, vibrant, exciting and yet simple and precise and yet so comforting. I was just looking for a great fried rice example, something to inspire me and I feel like things have escalated. I feel like I just got crushed basically by a Chinese culinary monument. One thing that really struck me with the chef was the way he actually stir-fried that dish, like dancing almost. The, the stirring utensil, the pan and the stove and the man behind it, everything was becoming just one. <laughs> this is my kind of ballet, okay? That's the dancing I like. That importance of the stir-fry itself is something that was initially mentioned by Stephanie from the YouTube channel Chinese Cooking Demystified. Yeah, stir-frying and rice. Okay. are the basic components and ideas of what fried rice is. In all honesty, I did my share of stir-frying videos on this channel and I thought I had built up some stir-frying technique. Well, after seeing what I've seen, I need to go back to the drawing board. Like literally. Stir-frying is about two things, all right? First of all, the technique. So the moves, the timings and the heat control. Second, stir frying is about the tools, obviously, like the pan, the stirring element, the, the, the stove. That is also very important. Now, you cannot practice your technique if you don't have the right tools. So I'm going to start with these first. And not because it's easier to just go and buy stuff than to actually put some work into this. Not because of that. Number one, the pan. All right, let's see what we got. So, this right here is a frying pan. Not saying you cannot wrap up a good stir fry with a frying pan, but good is not what I'm aiming at. I'm aiming at a perfect fry rice. So, this is what I'm gonna use, a wok. Well, in case you've been living on planet Mars, a wok is basically like a salad bowl with a handle, but it won't melt if you place it on the stove. This is science. I mean, look at the shape of it. Beautifully gradual curve inside. It's like a ramp for the food to jump. It's calling for stir fry, okay? So woks can be made out of different materials, including cast iron. Very old woks often were made out of cast iron. It does hold the heat just fine, but it's either too heavy or too fragile. Like, look at this. I let it down on the floor once, and now I've got this enormous crack. I might have another crack. False alarm, it's just grease. Stainless steel. It's visually clean, but in terms of desired properties, it sucks. It really is not non-stick. It doesn't conduct heat well. To be honest, it's almost the worst here. Non-stick work. 
stir frying is supposed to be performed on very high heat. So non-stick pans should never be used on very high heat because it deteriorates the chemical coating inside. Basically, the inside of your pan is gonna melt. Teflon particles mixed in with your food? That's not wok hey man. And that all leads us to my material of preference right here. Carbon steel. Carbon steel is light but solid. It conducts heat well. It can also be pretty non-stick if you season it right. I made an entire episode about this. It's almost perfect except this. It's flimsy. 0.8 millimeters in thickness. For practice purposes, I'm gonna be using a portable gas stove and in this case having a thicker wok than this will matter very much because it's gonna hold more heat. This one? I don't think so. I don't think so. I don't think so. So the bottom of the wall can be flat or round. Flat is more of a home thing. It's simply more suited for Western domestic stove. Now at the restaurant, the chef used a round bottom wall, which allowed for a better, smoother, more fluid stir frying movement. So the second most important thing about the design are the handles you've got two choices here you've got the first one a long stick handle northern style wok and then you've got the cantonese style wok which has two short metal handles the long handle wok is the one that is the closest to a frying pan you can definitely pan toss with it i've seen it in restaurants but i've also seen it in people's home that wok seems to be more common in the north of china hence its name a northern wok or a mandarin wok now on the other hand the short handle wok this wok seems to be more common in the south of china hence its name cantonese or southern wok i've seen it in restaurants many times but i haven't seen it in homes so much maybe in china but here it's not that common now the thing with this short handle wok is that it's not supposed to be stuff fried in the air unlike this one which is basically because of the long handle and the leverage pretty easy thing to do no this one is supposed to rest on a pivoting point you see this structure underneath is gonna carry all the load I'm all for that. Plus, there's also another super valid reason. It looks so much more stylish. I feel like I'm gonna look like a badass with this one. I don't need excuses, do I? I gotta use this one. There's no way around this. Not exactly this one, because this is a pretty flimsy one that I got probably two years ago. I didn't know what I was buying. And so I had to resign myself to go and buy another one one that hopefully will be better okay. oh i like this much better i can see all the hammering marks inside which is a very good sign 51 centimeter that's 20 inches in diameter the critical part is the thickness obviously 1.6 millimeters i expected 1.5 delivers 1.6 i'm over the moon with this one a beautiful cooking vessel now the wok still is you know greasy and oily and rough on the edges but that was expected so if you want to transport carbon steel you have to coat it in some oil i'm basically gonna first sand the edges until they get a little smoother because i don't want to have any shards in my hands and then i'll just clean it i'm caressing i'm massaging the wok i might be pansexual that's that's an option Right, so the wok is now clean and also smooth. I'm just gonna lightly coat it with fresh oil. This is not for seasoning purposes, but it's just gonna prevent the wok from rusting during practice time, because there would be a lot of that. I guess that's it for the wok. Let's just address the stirring utensil now. This is what I use today, like either a wooden or a metal spatula or spoon. The problems, well, there are many problems. The curves don't match the wok so much. It's often too short. It's not great to scoop, especially with the high walls of a wok. And also as a side note, I've never seen a wok chef using a small wooden spoon. 
So this was another option. This is something I've seen in Southeast Asia, but not so much in China. It's great for scraping. It's not great for the rest. If you want to scoop things, they might fall off. It doesn't seem to be good for smashing. So I guess my last and most promising option here is this one. It's not your average ladle. Oval in shape, it has an oversized head and the angle between the handle and the head is not the same as your typical ladle. You can scoop in or out, you can scrape, you can add things without getting your hands off the handle. You can smash, you can even spread with that wide bowl of a head. A bit like Neapolitan people do with pizza when they spread the sauce. It almost seems like that tool could never leave the head. I mean, let's not pretend any further. This is the one I'm going for. It's completely weird to me to be using this for a stir fry, but I'm up for the challenge. I'm going full Cantonese on this one. I'm all in, basically. Let's just settle down, Alex, okay? This is not war, although I'm getting prepared for it. I've got the sword, I've got the shield. I do need, however, a stir fry practicing Rick. Uh, I have seen culinary students using something very similar. This one, this guy, this guy is mastering it. So that's exactly what I need. I need to get these movement inside my body. I need to build up some muscle memory and to make a practice rig for that job and to just practice, practice. and confident that I was gonna swing it and that the rice was gonna stir fry properly. Nothing happened. Like literally nothing happened. When I do this, nothing happened. Yes, this one. Oh. This is absolutely pointless. All right, so I just gave my little stir frying rig a try using my super professional ladle and my uh, top of the line authentic Cantonese wok and guess what? It's way more complicated than I thought it would be. Sometimes I wonder what I was really expecting. Does this mean that I'm gonna give up? No, hell no. This learning curve is like the caramelized bits at the bottom of the pan, it's the best part to know that I can level up, that there's a notion of things I can learn in front of me. However, just to bring the excitement down a bit, uh, it also means that I need to do things in the right order. And instead of tackling a practice head on, I need first to build a solid layer of theory. So that's basically what we're gonna do next week. In the meantime, take care, bye-bye, salut. Okay, let's talk about today's sponsor, Squarespace. Squarespace has powerful blogging tools to share recipes, photos, videos, and recommendations. Categorize, share, and schedule your posts to make your content work for you. And share content over on Facebook, Twitter, Google+, LinkedIn, StumbleUpon, Reddit, Pinterest, and Tumblr. With Squarespace, you can get the right message to the right people. Collect email addresses through your website and send subscribers the information they care about the most with unique mailing list. The Squarespace blogging platform supports a configurable sharing button, letting your visitors share content on all social platforms. With Squarespace, you can connect with your audience and generate revenue through gated members-only content. Manage your members, send email communications, and leverage audience insights, all on one easy-to-use platform. Buying a domain from Squarespace is simple because there are no hidden fees or price hikes. Each domain comes with an ad-free parking page 
page and a free Whois privacy on eligible domains. Squarespace sells over 200 top-level domains so you can find the perfect name for your website. Choose an address that ends in .com, .net, .org or even get more specific with the .art. Check out squarespace.com for a free trial and when you're ready to launch, go to squarespace.com slash frenchguide to get 10% off your first purchase of a domain or a website. Thank you Squarespace for sponsoring this video.